A little while ago I made a video about Paper Mario the Thousand Year Doors unused dialogue. This video was the result of the work on my website Dialogue Tree, where I wanted to take all of the game's dialogue and document it. I just found so many interesting things during the process that I had to share with people. It quickly became obvious that the unused dialogue was the most sizable and interesting part of my findings, so I decided to focus on only that in my first video. But there's still so much more I want to get off my chest. The dialogue that is accessible in the game but just not seen by most people, insight into how the game's dialogue system seems to work, and just other dialogue related stuff I want to talk about. So consider this a part 2 of sorts in the The Dialogue of the Thousand Year Door series. I hope you'll indulge me as I just kinda ramble about dialogue for a bit. Let's start by looking at the English regional differences, because there's really only one. In the PAL version, Kupiku says this during the postgame. Coops looked kinda mature lately, pretty cool, but I kinda miss that old timid Coops. This piece of dialogue is completely absent in the American version. It's not just sitting in the files unused, it's literally not there. But this absence is a mistake that's fixed in the PAL version, because this dialogue did exist in the original Japanese version. Because this text doesn't exist at all in the American release, that probably means it was translated at a different time than the rest of the game. It might even have been translated by a European Nintendo employee, completely unrelated to the original translation team. Aside from that one, the only regional changes to the English translation that I'm aware of are Goombella's Tattles of Rockhog and Red Spiked Up. The NTSC version shows them as having one more defense point than they actually do, so another instance of Pell fixing a mistake in the original translation. Stuff like this was pretty standard in those days. The PAL region almost always got games last, and as a result, that version was usually the most bug-free. However, that's not to say it's perfect. Even in this final version of the game, there's plenty of dialogue issues they could have fixed, but didn't. Like, in the pit of one of the trolls, you'll find an enemy called a Dark Lakitu. When you tattle it, Goombella claims it will throw pipes at you, which will sometimes turn into sky blue spinies. That's not true, it just throws spiny eggs, like any other Lakitu. This mistake is absolutely bizarre, and it even makes its way into the Sky Blue Spiny Staddle as well. And it gets even more ridiculous when you find out why this mistake occurred. You see, the Japanese name for Spiny Egg is Pipo, which kinda sounds like the English word for pipe. But obviously, that's not what pipes are called in Japanese. The Japanese name for pipes in Mario is Dokan. Now, in the translator's defense, Japanese actually has quite a lot of borrowed English words. Because of that, it's not uncommon for Japanese games to name characters or objects after English words. For example, the Japanese name for Meta Knight is Meta Naito. With that in mind, it's not completely out of the question that Paipo would be pipe, but if you're translating a Mario game, you should probably know that it's not. The borrowed word that Mario doesn't use is actually Pipe. Another weird mistake regarding Tattles is that Koopa Troopa's Tattle dialogue doesn't list any of its stats. It's kind of a weird mistake, and it's pretty unfortunate that the one enemy this happened with happens to be the first enemy to have a defense point. That's pretty important to communicate to the player. Also, I don't know if this is a mistake, but Goomba is the only enemy to not have any text following its stat overview when tattling them. I'm not demanding they fix this in the remaster or anything, it's just a little weird that this only happens once. This next mistake on the other hand, this one really drives me up a wall. Let me set the scene. It's the end of the game, you just beat Grodus, the primary antagonist in combat. But Grodus has one final trick up his sleeve. He reveals Princess Peach trapped inside of a force field and shows himself to be the most ruthless antagonist Mario has ever faced by giving him an ultimatum. Either let me kill you, or I kill her. And then you have to choose. Now, of course Nintendo would never allow Princess Peach to be killed in this situation, but just suspend disbelief for a second. Allow yourself to be lost in the story. What do you do in this situation? Do you risk Princess Peach's life by attacking now, or risk your own by waiting for a better opportunity? Well, if you give in to his demands, Grotus will say, Worm, you dare defy me? Do you not care for the life of your pitiful princess? Very well then. Yeah, that's the wrong response. The dialogue in this, arguably the most dramatic choice in any Mario game, is reversed. What a way to ruin the moment, and how has no one caught this during testing? I swear, if they do not fix this in the remaster, I will fucking riot. Like, forget the backtracking, this is genuinely my biggest problem with the Thousand Year Door in its current form. I know it's just a little dialogue mix-up, but you could not have picked a worse moment for that if you tried. 
Um, anyway, the translators also made a mistake naming this Twilighter. When he's a pig, Gumbella calls him Freddy, but when you lift a curse and tattle him, Gumbella decides his name is Gloomer instead. And no, it's not a different guy. In the Japanese version, he's called Freddy in both cases. One of the biggest victims of localization is the references to Paper Mario 64. For example, the Chestnut King that Luigi is supposed to fight to save Princess Eclair is actually King Goomba from the first game. The joke is supposed to be that his adventure is so pathetic that the final boss is someone who was just a tutorial boss to Mario. If you help Pine T Jr. with his trouble, he'll later email you where he'll talk about his father taking care of Boo Boo in Toad Town. There's no such character in Toad Town, it's a mistranslation. His dad is actually taking care of the little oinks. Similarly, Kupuk sent you an email where he talks about how his hide and seek adventures brought him to Goomstar Temple. I used to think this was a sequel tease or a made up location to make the world feel bigger, like the places Luigi goes to. But no, this actually was supposed to be the Crystal Palace. You see, the Japanese name for that place is Krista Shinden, the first word of which being a combination of crystal and star. But it just so happens that Kuri is also the first half of Goomba's Japanese name Kuribo. So that's how we ended up with Goomstar instead. Lastly, there's one more thing I hope to see fixed in the remaster, and that's Hooktail's weakness. Not everyone figures out Hooktail's weakness by themselves, and if you were to tell them afterwards, you'd probably get one of two reactions. Either, oh, I get it now, or wait, that was supposed to be crickets? And really, I can't blame them. The sound effect doesn't sound much like crickets, does it? In fact, it's literally not crickets. In the Japanese script, Hooktail's weakness was actually frogs. The problem is that the sound used in the game is a call from a Japanese species of frog. It's not immediately recognizable as frogs to us westerners, so the translators decided to change the weakness to crickets, because apparently they thought that more closely resembled the sound. Really, what they should have done is simply change the sound effect to a more universally recognizable one. You know, like... Maybe there's a technical reason it couldn't be done during localization, but surely they can figure something out for the remaster? Alright, let's talk about some of that obscure dialogue now. This will by no means be comprehensive. I'm sure I don't need to tell you about, say, the hidden entrance to the trouble center. No, this is just a random selection of ones I want to talk about. At the start of the game, when you visit East Rogueport for the first time, a bandit will bump into you and steal half your coins. I'm sure you already know, but if you then turn back and visit this house, you can make him give you your coins back. But what happens if you don't have enough coins when the theft is supposed to take place? You know, like maybe you were role-playing as Mario and just had to buy as many mushrooms as possible. Well, if you visit the bandit after that happens, he will instead say, Who's that? Hey, aren't you that doofus who clutched into me? You really owe it to yourself to carry a little cash around, buddy. Treat yourself right. I mean, I went to the trouble of trying to pick your pocket, but I didn't get a single coin. They definitely didn't need to write dialogue for that, because who's gonna see this, but I'm glad they did. I love when developers think about these little edge cases that probably wouldn't even occur to you as a player. Like, take Luigi, for example. When you talk to him for the first time, he'll explain he's on an adventure to save Princess Eclair. He tells you this the very first time you speak, regardless of when that is. For most players, it would be between chapters 1 and 2, but it can be at any point in the game. Except, there comes a point where Luigi's quest is over, so it wouldn't really make sense for him to give you that initial speech anymore. Well, the developers thought of that. He has a different introduction for if you don't talk to him until after chapter 7. Well, hey, big brother. Fancy meeting you here. What the coinky dink? Huh? Who, me? Well, I was in the area, so I thought I'd drop by this inn. One thing led to another. I don't know why you would wait this long to talk to him. It's Luigi. You gotta talk to Luigi. But hey, just in case you're that guy, the developers have got you covered. A common reason for an NPC's dialogue to be obscure is when it updates at a point when you really have no reason to visit them anymore. There's plenty of that in this game. Here's just a few of them. Dupree and the Traveling Sisters are recurring characters that show up in almost every chapter. The only exception is Chapter 5, because you're isolated from society during that chapter. But I wouldn't blame you if you thought they weren't in Chapter 2, either. Dupree will show up in the area where you fought the Shadow Sirens after you defeat them. Hello, little friends. I came to warn you that the Shadow Sirens were added here. Alors, it looks like I am too late. That's the totally gross guy, Dupree. What the heck is that guy doing here? 
Oh my gosh, you don't think he followed us here because he's infatuated with me, do you? No? Oh, what, like it's not even possible? That's kind of insulting, Mario. And the traveling sisters will come admire the great tree after you've already found your way inside. Hey, 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 it's us, the Happy Wanderers, the World Traveling Sisters 3. What a big tree. Oh, oh, I want to climb it. I want to go up to the top too. Hey, where's the elevator, huh? When you beat Chapter 7, the game kind of tries to rush you into starting Chapter 8 and finishing the game. But for some reason, Coopley's dialogue updates after Chapter 7 and it's replaced after you beat Chapter 8. Coopley is the only character in this area whose dialogue updates at this point. If Coops is not your active party member, he'll say, Mario, don't let Coops know, but I have this dream. Are you ready for it? Someday, I want to go on an adventure with Coops. I get the feeling that day's not too far off now somehow. That's two I owe you, Mario. And if Coops is your active party member, he'll say, Okay, Coops, it's time for me to teach you my own patented fighting technique. If you can master this skill, you'll be ready for any foe. I like to call it the power shell. Hmm? You already know it. Hmm. So kids grow even without their parents. Frankie's and Francesca's dialogue has it even worse. They have dialogue exclusive to Chapter 8, so you'll have to enter the Thousand Year Door, leave, and then talk to them. Frankie and I are madly in love, but I'm not really sure he wants kids. It's kind of sad. Yeah, boy, having kids. Listen, Mario, when does a guy find true happiness? Whoa, what am I saying? The Beyond the Syndicate boss can't be talking like that. After you beat Chapter 6, you can keep riding the Excess Express just for fun. When you do, the train will be populated by generic NPCs. But these NPCs aren't the same on every trip. Instead, the train will contain 9 passengers, drawn from a pool of 40 possible passengers. Here's just a couple. Hey, um, where's the bathroom on this train? Do you know? I can hold on a little longer, so I'll keep looking. Ugh, why do I have to travel for work and get shook on every plane, train and boat? I should be at home with my new bride. I need to get back home. Oh, my lovely wife. You know, this would be pretty normal dialogue if it weren't coming from a Yoshi. You're supposed to say Yoshi. Prepare for a sudden quiz, but first let's say Coops ten times quickly. Ready? Coops, 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 Coops. All right, now here's the question. What did Bowser nab in the last Paper Mario? Oh, um, uh, the, the cookie. Ah, shit. You only get one shot at answering this question too. After that, the toad will forever tell you he's thinking of the next question. And I do mean forever. If you save your game after this, you will never get that question again on that save file. Of course, the glitz bit has plenty of obscure dialogue. For example, you're not likely to lose your first battle against the Goomba Bros. And if you do, Grubba won't be too impressed. Gonzalez, that wasn't pretty, getting whooped by a bunch of pushovers like that. You won't even make it to the majors, let alone become champ, fighting like that. Hey, but never give up, you hear? Now I gotta go, son. Jolene's got your fight money. Jolene has a version of this as well. Obviously, losing to the Goomba Bros at this point is even more unlikely. Boy, losing like that, you've been out of the game for too long, I guess. You need to choose, either retire once and for all, or work to reclaim your glory. In my last video, I mentioned the Destructors, a replacement team for Bandy Andy, for which you would need to rank down almost the entire roster to see. The team's introduction dialogue makes fun of this, claiming your meeting must have been because of your terrible luck. You got bad luck getting matched up against us. And when you lose to them, they'll say, Hey, sorry, tough luck. No, it wasn't luck, we're just too tough. And also in my previous video, I briefly mentioned that after Chapter 3, your locker roommates will have dialogue acknowledging your movement between leagues. There was an unused version of these meant for Chapter 3 itself, but the equivalents for after Chapter 3 did get used. When you de-rank from the Major League back to the Minor League, the Minor Leaguer's dialogue will permanently change to this. Man, ain't nothing better than fighting here in the Glitz Pit. Nothing. Fighting to climb the ranks just makes me feel alive, know what I'm saying? Little stuff don't get me down no more. Ain't that the way to live, G-Dog? Gonzalez, why- BOM! Are you still spinning your wheels here? Go blow up some fools. BOM! But watch out, BOM! Because I'll be gunning for you, BOM! Soon. 
Crack, Mustache must take care of business. Mustache is only fighter Clefter ever respects. <laughs> take it easy now. Losing your cool never helps anything. When you climb back to the Major League, the Major Leaguers will have this to say. So, you still have some moves we haven't seen? Cool, bring it. I can't wait. No matter what, keep your eyes on the prize, man. That's how you get through. You can only climb so high, but it seems like you can fall forever. The Koopinator's dialogue doesn't update here, but I think it was supposed to. The Major Leaguers also have dialogue for when you lose the Champs Belt, and listen to Koopinator's dialogue here. There's no way this wasn't intended for re-entering the Major League from the Minor League. You, Gonzales, time and again you rise from the lower ranks. Commendable. But now it is over for you. Allow me to give you a final resting place. The other fighter's dialogue is presumably as intended. Winning consistently is just so hard, but I'm gonna do it by gum. I'm gonna be champion. Shameful, and you're a hammerer. Have you no pride in your hammer, man? Come on now, pull it together. What happened to the Gonzales I knew, baby? The game has a bunch of NPCs whose dialogue changes if you have a specific party member out. In Glitzville, that's this Toad and Mr. Hoggle, both of which react to Yoshi. And I already mentioned Coopley earlier as well. The one I want to focus on though is Papetch. This guy reacts to Barbary, and I kinda love all of his dialogue for when Barbary is your active party member. Most of the other NPCs in this category just stick to one thing. They think your party member is cool and give them some words of encouragement or whatever, but Papatch is all over the place. So, Bobbery, you're off to have a peep at the Skull Rock with Captain Stash? I'd be right there with you, but me Gram Gram told me once, No Skull Rocks. So, so you'd better back up Captain Stash without me, alright mate? Boy, I get all squirmy inside when I hear them Piantas getting all lovey-dovey. I wonder if Bobbery was like that with Miss Scarlet all them long years ago. Yuck, just imagining it gives me a bit of bile in the old gut. The sunset from here is just blooming amazing. You ought to take a look sometime, Bobbery. It explodes with light. Yeah, kinda like the light from your blast, Admiral. But no offense, of course, you can just pretend I didn't say that. When I hear the sound of the ocean, I remember being a wee baby. So, Admiral, what kind of baby were you, eh? You didn't have a mustache as a wee one, did you? Maybe I'm the dummy here, but did you know that Wacka has four different reactions to being hit? One of them is for the final hit when he disappears for good, and another is what I thought was for every other case. The remaining two I almost put in my unused dialogue video. I had already recorded the voiceover for it and everything. Then, when I was recording the footage, I finally found out what the other two reactions are for. It's based on who is damaging Wacka. There's one for Mario, one for Koops, and one for Barbary. You know what else is more dialogue than I initially thought? The Bowser platformer segments. At the start of those, Bowser says something to hype himself up. I thought that maybe these were randomly drawn from a pool of like 5 or 10. But no, there's a total of 32 things that Bowser can say at the start of these levels. And they're not random, they appear in a predetermined order. And you have to die a total of 29 times to see the last quote. That gets you only 30, the last two appear in the water level only. Lastly, I just want to talk a bit about the internal workings of the game's dialogue system. Uh, some of this is going to be somewhat speculative. Dialogue Tree was my first ever experience looking inside of a video game. I don't have the technical know-how to, say, look at memory values and deduce from those what's going on under the hood. So, I'm basing this on what I've seen from the dialogue files themselves, and my own experimentation by editing these files. Luckily for me, the game stores all of its dialogue in plain text files, so that did make my job significantly easier. And when I looked in there, the thing that immediately struck me was how inefficient the dialogue system appears to be. There's a lot of redundancy in these files. From what I can gather, I think each area in the game has a number of story points at which all NPCs are expected to change their dialogue. Not all of these NPCs actually do though, and for the ones that don't, they don't simply use the message from the previous point in the story. Instead, they get assigned an exact duplicate of that message. For example, Rogueport Harbor is set to update all NPCs at the end of every chapter, and a few additional points in the story. 
and each NPC in this location has to have their dialogue set for these story points. So that means that this Babam Sailor, whose dialogue stays the same from the moment you recruit Gumbella up until you bring the Ruby Star to the Thousand Year Door, has the same message listed in the dialogue text file in five different places. You may think that this is sloppy programming, and yeah, arguably it is, but when you're coding a video game, I imagine elegance isn't a top priority. What you'd probably be most concerned with is speed and the game's performance. The main drawback of this implementation is that it increases the game's file size, which doesn't really matter. As long as the game fits on the disc, it's irrelevant how much space you save. One other drawback of this system is that it's a bit error prone. If you want to change a piece of dialogue, you have to make that change in all of its duplicates as well. Every instance of that same text is a new opportunity to make a mistake. That's what happened to our Babam buddy from earlier. Because if you pay very close attention, you might spot a slight difference in one of those five versions of his message. Normally, the text stops for a short moment after he says, after all. These short pauses in the text are how the game makes its dialogue feel a bit more like spoken words. You can get a sense of how the lines are being delivered. But this pause is missing in the chapter 3 version of this message. Something that wouldn't have happened if the dialogue didn't need to be stored in separate places like this. Side effects of all this duplicate text can be found in other places too. Like in chapter 3, the promoter condition don't use items randomly becomes don't use any items after you reach the major league. Or in Hooptail's castle, one of the keys you get there inexplicably has different text than the others. And no, it's not because that one opens a different kind of door. Another source of duplicate text are your partners. Each partner has to have their own version of the dialogue they speak, even if the text is identical. For example, remember that scene where you're spying on Grubba and you have to make a sound to quell his suspicion? I always assumed that this text box belonged to Mario, but no, your partner is the one making this sound. And because of that, each of those messages has to have their own version for each party member, even though they're all the same. Also, by now you've probably noticed these things that look kinda like HTML tags in the script. These are some of the text functions the game uses to modify its dialogue. As you know, when the game writes out dialogue, it writes each character, one by one. But when it encounters a left angle bracket, it doesn't read that as a part of the script. Instead, it looks ahead until the next right angle bracket and treats the characters in between as a function call. Sometimes that's just a single word, but if there's a space between the brackets, the game will take the first word as a function and everything else as arguments for that function. For example, for the wait function, the argument is the length of time that the game should wait before drawing the next character in milliseconds. That's the effect we saw on the Babam earlier. There's plenty of other functions too. The most important ones are K and P. K halts the text indefinitely until the player presses A and P clears the text box so that new text can be written. These usually go together, but they don't need to be. P is sometimes used without K to make auto-advancing text, but K is never used without P. If it was, it could be used to do things like this. Aside from those, there's also shake and wave. These are animations that are applied to all following letters to give them a sense of emotion. However, these two cannot be combined. If both shake and wave are active, the text will only shake. I don't think this was intended though. There's actually some dialogue that does attempt to call both of these effects at the same time. When I was building my site, I had originally implemented these animations so that they could be combined, but the result looked off to me. It wasn't until I tried to compare it to the in-game look that I realized the game just doesn't do it. Paper Mario 64 did successfully combine these effects, so I'm not really sure why the Thousand Year Door wasn't able to. Maybe there's something about the dialogue system that made it so the logic couldn't simply be carried over. Or maybe they just forgot. Other text functions include Scale, Dynamic, Speed, Call, Icon, Anim, and the dialogue box types. These are System, Select, Small, Hosso, which means Broadcast, Diary, Kanban, I don't know what that one means, but it's for signs, Tech, Boss, and Majo, which means Witch. Curiously, these dialogue box tags seem to get hoisted. 
which means that when the game calls a piece of dialogue, it first checks if these dialog box functions are present anywhere in the text, and then executes them first, regardless of their actual placement. This means that any set of dialogue can only have one type of dialog box. You can't change dialog boxes midstream. Also, it's possible for these dialog boxes to have a different default text color, but only tech and system use this feature. For some reason, the text in the Majo dialog box, which is used by Bonetail and Shadow Queen, has its color set manually every time. Here's what the dialog would look like if the color wasn't set. Anyway, that's basically everything I still wanted to talk about. Thanks for listening to me ramble about Paper Mario dialogue some more. I can finally rest easy now. So, uh, yeah. Bye.